Welcome everyone to Unbound, the Bay Area Book Festival's virtual conversations. I'm Giovanna Lamonto and I'll be your monitor for a great discussion today entitled 2020 Bay Area Book Festival Writing Contest Showcase. Joining me today are Christopher Hyun, Marianne Lonsdale, Melinda Yang, Nora Tan, Kelly Du, and Starley Chigade, winners of this year's writing contest. I'm so excited to present you with such talented writers and to congratulate them for producing such incredible pieces. Each winner will read an excerpt from their piece and each section will end with a Q&A session. And this year's festival is unlike any of our previous years. It's completely online. And because of the changes, we decided that opening the contest to all age groups would allow us to better celebrate the merits of a larger community. We divided the submissions into three sections, middle school, high school, the original intended contestant pool for this project, and adult. All three of our categories were promptly populated with talent from all across the Bay Area. There was a first, a second, and a third place winner in each category, and we're excited to welcome many of them today here. I'm proud to present six of our winners and their stories in today's panel. These stories were selected from a pool of 80 submissions for the Bay Area Book Festival's writing contest, and this year's winners were chosen for their creativity, their style, and the quality of their writing. Today, they have the opportunity to share their stories with you. This year's prompt was based off of the idea of expectations. This was the listing we posted. Tell us a story about expectations. Expectations can be imposed internally and externally, from yourself or from the people around you. How do you navigate your place within a world that constantly expects something from you? How do you balance your expectations with those of your parents, your friends, or society? Expectations can be both burdens and blessings, and now it's up to you to write about them. Your piece can be anything you like, but the topic of expectations should be at its core. Ironically, but not unexpectedly, our own expectations as contest judges were far exceeded and were beyond pleased with the quality of the work submitted. As a result of the general talent this year, it was especially difficult to select three winners from every category, but we settled on nine winners, all of whom have stories posted on the Bay Area Book Festival website, which means you can read the full pieces online. We have six of the nine winners with us today, and without further ado, I present Kelly from the Middle School Division. Hello, my piece is called Sugar Cookies, and I'm going to share an excerpt from it. I squirmed uncomfortably as I sat down on the cold metal chair. My mother shot me a stern glance as I continued to squirm. Stop moving. I stopped moving as the auditorium stage lit up. Then I watched as my sister confidently walked across the stage, holding a piece of paper in her right hand. I watched as she firmly placed her hand on the podium. She opened her mouth and began speaking. Her mellifluous voice filling the quiet auditorium and captivating those who heard her. Even though she probably couldn't see me specifically, it felt like she was staring right at me. As she finished her last word, the audience erupted in thundering applause. The girl walked off the stage and returned to her seat, and a man walked up on the stage replacing her. Thank you for joining us as we celebrate those who gra graduate today. He continued his introduction, and I sat listening. When it ended, loud applause followed. As the applause died down, everyone began to scramble and find their loved ones. Great job, Lorena, my mother said as she strode over. Your speech was amazing. I'm sure everyone would agree. Lorena smiled as my mother complimented her hard work. What do you think, Willow? Lorena asked. It was good. Is that so? I'm glad. I tilted my head and looked at my sister, smiling as she thanked those who congratulated her as we made our way out of the auditorium. That day, I decided I wanted to be just like her. Willow, I groggily, I groggily opened my eyes to my older sister waving her slender hand in front of me. I smiled and replied, sorry, I fell asleep. It's fine. I was just thinking of making some sugar cookies for us to enjoy. Would you care to help me? I nodded. This was just like my sister. She was selfless, kind, and intelligent. An ideal person. Hey, Lorena, I said as I watched her combine the vanilla extract and eggs in a bowl. You know, these cookies remind me of you. Because they're my favorite, she replied, 
No, because they're perfectly made and molded. I received no response, but when I looked at her, I got my response. I saw a deep regret present in her, something I never saw in my sister. I decided to ignore it, and I continued whisking the bowl she gave me. As we finished the dough, Lorena brought out the metal cookie cutters and began pressing it deep into the dough. She raised the cutter and revealed a star-shaped piece of dough with perfectly clean cuts. By the time we finished, we had 16 identical stars. Aren't they pretty, I said. My sister said nothing but smiled in response. When the cookies were finished, we placed them nicely on a tray and presented them to our mother. The three of us sat together and indulged in the cookies. I was so happy that day, I forgot about the melancholy present in her eyes. As autumn transi transitioned to winter, so did Lorena. The hours she once spent studying and cleaning were now spent laying in her bed. I watched as the energy drained out of her. I watched as she became lethargic. I watched as she disregarded everything, but I did not know what to do. Mother scrambled to help her, but nothing changed. Our efforts didn't show any results. The evenings we spent together as a family now turned to just me and my mother. Day by day, we sat silently at dinner. We did not mention anything. We pretended as if everything was okay. The miasma over our home grew heavier and heavier. Then winter became spring and spring became summer. Each day, more and more monotone. Kelly, that was a beautiful piece. I've got a couple questions to get a little Q&A kind of started with you. We'll be doing this with every single winner today, um, but we'll start with Kelly. So for you, I noticed that you use a lot of different metaphors and symbolism throughout your piece. And I was wondering whether or not you intended to begin with those. Was that your initial intention? Did you want to start with a metaphor or a simile or, or a symbol? Or did it end up happening as you kept writing? I wanted to start with it. So when I first saw the prompt, the first thing that came to my mind was like some sort of mold or like in this case, the first thing I thought of was cookie cutters. And I really wanted to like incorporate that in my piece. And I really wanted to show the connection between the two. And do you feel a personal connection to this sort of symbol of the cookie cutters? Um, is there a personal experience that you would like to share with us that might be similar? If not, then feel free to talk about how, how the writing felt to you, um, how, whether or not it was cathartic for you to write about um, something that relates to expectations being so heavily influenced by other people. Uh, there wasn't a specific experience that like, I can really relate to in this piece, but I really wanted to write about it because I think expectations are like, things that is in society and they can both help and like break down a person because it can both pressure a person to do better and it can both hurt them and I wanted to show how it can go both ways. That's beautifully put and absolutely true and um, as we're talking about expectations and um, all of the results that come from it, I'm not sure how you felt after winning the festival contest. And I would love to know about how you, your expectations were in relation to this contest and winning it and what your gut reaction was. What was the first thing that you did once you found out that you won? Um, just give us a little bit of insight onto the moment that you found out. Um, when I first got the email, the first thing I did was double check that it was actually sent to my name and it was sent to the right person. Then I, told my family and they were all really surprised. When I finished my piece, I was proud of it because even if I didn't win, it was, I was proud of it and that was the best work I could put out there and that was all I can do. Well, it was a great work and I'm so glad that you did put it out there because then we all got to enjoy it and everybody can enjoy it by reading it on the Bay Area Book Festival website. Um, and as we close up with Kelly's turn, I will call Chris to the stage. Chris from the adult division, you are up. Hi, um, I'm Chris Hyun, 
and I'll be reading from a story titled Burn Caught. Um, I'll be starting in the middle of the story when the main character, Yoon, a Korean man, is on a boat in the middle of the Ganges River of India. So this is Burn Caught. 20 minutes had has passed, and only now Yoon realizes he did not say goodbye to his friend. Yoon does not speak to the boatman. He's too embarrassed of his broken English and too shy to use the few Hindi phrases he has practiced since arriving in India. The boatman rows with his back downstream, the burn got illuminated behind him. Yoon stares for a moment at him, thinking, one day his body may also burn on this river. The boat floats toward the burn god, on which flames engulf six bodies on separate pyres of wood. Yun expects to smell burnt flesh, but smoke and charred sandalwood hang midair as if emanating from a burning temple. Come, come, says the boatman, waving his hands for Yun to get off the boat. Yun fumbles with his bags, walking like a drunken man onto the cot. He climbs the stone steps. There are ashes, and they cling to the bottom of Yun's shoes. He passes the heat of a fire and hears a loud pop. Was that a plank of wood or someone's skull, thinks Yoon. He rushes up the stairs of the riverbank, sweating. He reaches a ledge with the view of a burning body five feet below him. He remembers his camera and points it downward toward the flames, his arms stretched for a closer shot. Orange-yellow light outlines the body, filling the camera screen. Suddenly, Yoon's bag slips down to his elbow, and he loses his grip on his phone. It tumbles onto the stomach of the burning body. A priest looks up and starts pointing and shouting at Yoon. Some men run up the stairs toward him. Yoon bolts away from the burning bodies, away from the river, the boat, the men, toward what he thinks is the main road. Dark, narrow alleyways smell of animal sweat. Bulls, buildings, and bicycles block his way, turning and twisting him until he's unsure of his original direction. He slips on cow dung. His tailbone hits hard on the uneven cobblestone road. A woman, out of nowhere, says, Oh my, are you okay? Yun looks up to see an Indian woman in a pink sari. I'm okay, but, but how do you know how to speak Korean? He asks while getting himself up. My husband owns the Korean restaurant near Burncott. Actually, I own it, but he runs it. I learned Korean from YouTube. Your Korean is very good, but I'll be late for my train. Where should I go? She points to the gully behind him. I'll go to your restaurant during my next visit. Bohut Danyawad. Yoon bows while backtracking. He hears traffic in the distance and runs toward the sound of car horns. Yoon finds himself on the main road and hops onto a parked rickshaw. Citation, he says out of breath to the auto rickshaw driver. The driver nods and starts the loud engine of the rickshaw, exhaust spewing behind them. As they drive away, Yoon looks back and sees a group of men chanting while carrying a wrapped body toward the burn cot. Unthinking, he reaches for his camera to take a video. Yoon pauses and thinks to himself, the burn cot has taken my phone. The road is bumpy. Wind blows through the auto rickshaw, cooling Yoon's head and his chest. He looks forward as he heads toward the station, onto a train, and out of the city. That was incredible, Chris. Even more beautiful read out loud. You have a wonderful reading voice. Oh, thanks. Uh, I practiced a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it all paid off. You did a wonderful <laughs> job. And um, I was noticing that you um, have a very delicate balance between event and detail. Um, you have a lot of beautiful descriptions, like intertwined in all of your pieces, in your, all of your pieces, sentences. But um, you also move it forward with so many different events that are happening in the middle of the story. Was this a conscious balance or did you... In, or is it just a natural way of writing for you? How did you approach this sort of writing style for a contest? I would say it's mostly natural, but I do like, I do pay attention to some of the pacing. So when you add more details and it slows a bit down, but that's um, part of trying to build that up and down of the story. So adding the details of, I, I mean, having experienced uh, living in India for some time, um, I do, you get, 
sometimes all of these feelings and senses and what you see. So I like that description, but then I like some action as well and moving forward uh, uh, since that's the type of story that I like to read. That's awesome. So um, I've been referring to all of y'all as writers and winners. Um, And would you describe yourself as a writer? And what other terms would you use to title yourself just so that we can get to know you and this piece a little bit more? Um, I think after uh, winning this contest, I think maybe I can call myself a writer now. (laughs) I think when I received your email uh, saying that I had won, um, I was like, this is some scam. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know who this person is. I don't know why they're emailing me and why they would want all my information. But um, so so it took me a while to like let it sink in and say, oh, maybe I am a writer. Um, but I'm also, uh, I'm also still in grad school, so I'm also a student, um, and um, I'm also, I have a partner, but so many titles, but yeah. Um, I'm also apparently a scientist, so, because <laughs> 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 that's what I'm going to grad school for. Well, we love interdisciplinary talents, yeah. so um, that was absolutely incredible, and I have one more question um, for you today. Um, when you originally wrote your piece, what did you intend for us to feel or what did you intend to convey at the end of the piece? Did you have an end goal in creating this piece or did it just come out and flow pretty naturally? Um, I wanted to write a piece uh, kind of getting into um, maybe a Korean experience. I'm from a Korean American background and of a person that is kind of locked in language um, as well. And so I wanted people to see that what I've experienced in India when I've met Korean people in India as well, how they're kind of locked into a different category. Um, And I also wanted the unexpectedness of an Indian woman who speaks Korean, and I've met people like that as well. Um, and, uh, these are kind of specific, like a specific restaurant I'm thinking of when I'm writing it. And so I wanted people to experience all the nuances of language and to meet different people, um, that they might've never thought of before. Well, that's awesome. I'm so glad that we did get to meet them. Um, and with that, I think we'll close out Chris's section. Thank you so much for coming today. And I will introduce Nora from the middle school division. Nora, you're up. Uh, Hi, my name is Nora Tan, and I will be reading from my story called Reality. All right, um, okay. The person in front of me was hovering about a few feet off the ground. Vibrant colors twirled around him like he was being circled by the fireworks. He had a mischievous smile on his face as he greeted me. Ah, I blinked, quite baffled. The things I usually see don't normally talk to me. Uh, what are you? I asked in a small voice. The man clothed in equally bright colors as his fireworks laughed, and in doing so, the colors seemed to dance and whirl around him like flames. I'm your guardian angel, of course. He drawled, his, he drawled out his title with slight distaste, but spoke as if it was the simplest and most obvious thing in the world. However, before I could question him further, my attention was brought towards the doctor in front of me. Molly, he said. As I directed my gaze toward him, he gave an all-too-familiar, gentle, sugary smile. Are you all right? You haven't had more hallucinations, have you? If you're too tired, we can reschedule your appointment. Uh, His statement was dripping with disgusting pity that irked me to no end. Uh, I was very tired of the pity people seemed to constantly give me, especially when they see the scars, but I was most definitely not fragile. I think, anyways. Uh, but what did it matter? The opinions of a girl gone mad held little weight, if any at all. I was hardly listening to the doctor. Whenever I come, it's always the same. However, my attention was captured by the man suddenly floating behind him, and he began to mimic his actions. I gave a little giggle as I saw him exaggerating his performance with flourishing movements. The doctor had a concerned look upon his face. I smiled innocently, widening widening my eyes and stretching my lips into a small smile. I couldn't wait for this appointment to end. It had been a couple hours since my checkup. I busied myself with watching the man perform silly tricks. The the doctor couldn't see him, so he wrote a lot of notes when I let loose a couple of small giggles at the ridiculous man. Today I was sitting in my room. I wanted to keep to to myself today. Uh, I was going through what the doctors referred to as a psychotic episode, but I refer to it as simply a living nightmare. 
One where instead of me controlling the dreams, the nightmares seemed to control me. Today was especially bad. I could hear the drainage pipes roaring. The medical band on my wrist was slowly coiling up my arm. It had a predatory stance, like a boa constrictor, and I was the prey. The fluorescent, the fluorescent rays of light came down from the ceilings and turned into vines. They were brittle and coarse, wrapping around my body until I could hardly breathe. I desperately tried to wriggle and scratch my way out. Molly, I heard a firm voice. Listen to me, it's not real. It's just in your head, you're perfectly safe. Nothing will hurt you. Just follow my voice and you'll be fine. I promise. I started to breathe again. The vines loosened ever so slightly. My eyes were still wide and my heart was still pounding like a drum, but I tried to calm down. I tried to steady my breathing. There was a small pinprick of pain, then nothing. And yeah, that's it. Nora, that was awesome. I'm so glad that I got to hear you read that out loud. Once again, incredible reading. I love the way that you um, kind of ran through the entire the entirety of all of the excerpts that you read out um, just so beautifully. And I could see that you were really into it and engaged with your own writing, and it was really inspiring. Thank you. Um, and so one quick question that I had for you was um, that it seems like your writing is very stream of consciousness. And since you're writing from a character's point of view, um, I noticed that you use somebody else's name. Um, as since you're writing from a character's point of view, um, how did you center yourself in creating a separate person that you could step into? In other words, how could you create another narrator that was so convincing and so real? Um, I not too sure. I kind of, for most of it, I kind of went with the flow. I kind of tried to put myself in the shoes of if someone were going through this, how they'd feel, or at least I tried my best to. Um, yeah, and I mean, I've sort of struggled with mental health, so I could kind of understand almost, but yeah. So uh, I tried to um, channel from a bit of my own experience how I'd feel if something were happen something like that were happening to me, uh, and honestly, how someone who is really afraid and pretty young would react to this. Excellent. Well, I'm I'm speaking as a writer. I know that we all use like little tidbits of our experiences and then expand on them as writers. In fact, that's kind of what a writer is meant to do. You're supposed to expand on some sort of experience that you've had in the past. And I really love the way that you did expand it. So um, I actually wanted to talk about size and scope in your piece in, in the terms that you were able to focus on small, minute details, such as the vines wrapping around Molly, um, but then also go to bigger questions of um, like mental health and the idea of feeling like yourself in a, in a piece that was so um, well integrated. And I just wanted to ask you um, if you had an intention of describing either one, of describing both, or um, if you had a word, an idea, a sentence, or a mood that you wanted to convey by the end of the piece. Um, I was just kind of trying to uh, have factors that, uh, factors that you'd normally find really frightening and trying to incorporate that into it so the reader can actually get a semblance of understanding as to uh, how what she has to go through basically on a daily basis and uh, the actual like fear in her of like normal everyday objects because mm -hmm. they uh, from her perspective they're honestly terrifying to her yeah and I just wanted to have people understand oh, sorry I wanted to have people understand that well, I think you did a wonderful job of helping people get gain a little bit of understanding and insight. It was a really beautiful piece, and I'm so excited to bring on the next person um, immediately after this. So, Marianne from the Adult Division, you are up. Thank you again, Nora. Hello. Um, I'm going to read an excerpt from a personal essay called Coming Back to Nick, and it's a piece that's near and dear to me. Um, 
Nick and I are walking down College Avenue trying to decide on a restaurant for dinner. I'm bundled up in a long wool coat and he's shivering in a t-shirt and shorts. I'm annoyed at my 13-year-old son for so many things on this cold November evening, one being that he never remembers a jacket. He pauses at the entrance to Cactus Taqueria, a usual favorite for both of us. Hey mom, how about tacos? He nearly shouts as I keep going. I don't answer. I'm frustrated with him for rejecting Oakland Tech, the high school I want him to go to. We toured the school before dinner. I'd been exhilarated by the diversity of the student body, the well thought out and pr proven approach to academics, the commitment of the teachers. Nick told me there was no way he'd be going there. He wouldn't know anybody. That was it, the only reason. Oakland Tech is a well-regarded public school with no tuition and we could no longer afford private school. Nick's still nervous about doing anything, going anywhere by himself. What he doesn't understand is he doesn't really have a choice. He runs a few steps to catch up with me. I hear his feet, but don't look behind me. Oh, mom, Nick's voice cracks. Don't be like that. Please don't be like that. My lean, handsome, dark-haired son has shot up to a few inches taller than me in the past year, but right now he sounds so small, so needy. I rarely get mad at Nick, and he can't stand it when I do. My heart softens a bit at the pain in his voice. I relent, and we walk back to Cactus, order our favorites, and eat in silence. Nick brings the pico de gallo that I like from the salsa bar and the hot habanero for himself. You're going to Oakland Tech, I explain while on the drive home. I'm mad that you won't even consider it. Nick bursts into tears. He's not a crier and he's sobbing. We'll get through this, Nick, I assure him. I think you'll do great at Tech. It's not that, Mom. I feel scared all the time. I'm sad all the time. I, I don't know what to do. Can you help me? His voice has a desperation I've not heard before. I take his hand and he grips mine. Sweetie, how long have you been feeling this way? A long time, that's what scares me, since seventh grade. It's November of eighth grade. It's been at least five months. Middle school has been hard. He doesn't seem to want to do anything with his guy friends and they don't invite him anywhere anymore. Everyone, including me, thinks Nick is gay, but we're not talking about that yet. All his friends are girls. Are you more upset tonight because I've been mad at you, I probe? I'm always upset. I just don't tell you. My gut tells me something is really wrong. My breathing slows and pulls deep into my belly until I realize I've stopped breathing and I let the air release. Do you know what would make you happy, I ask? What would make you feel better? That's what scares me the most, he says. He stops and cries for a few seconds. He turns his head away from me, looking out the car window. I don't know what would make me happy. I'm afraid I'm always going to be like this. His voice is shaky and low. Um, I think I'll end right there, and I really want to give a shout out and thank you to the Bay Area Book Festival for this opportunity and for all the programming. I've been going to everything since the festival started, and uh, I just uh, admire all the work so much. Thank you. Well, we're so glad to have you, Mary, and especially with a piece like that. I remember reading Coming Back to Nick for the first time and being absolutely blown away by just the accuracy of, and the poignancy of a specific moment, such as sitting in that car. Um, and so my question for you is that your piece touched on really emotionally poignant and evocative moments from your life. So how do you think that these visceral experiences best exhibit the paradigm of expectations that you interpret as individuals? In other words, why did you decide to write mm -hmm. the specific piece you submitted for this prompt? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I had actually started this piece and then saw the contest and, so, and then the contest became kind of an, uh, not just an impetus to get it done, but thinking even more about expectations and made me think about kind of um, almost like unidentified expectations I had around parenthood and parenting a teen and of the child I knew up to this point um, uh, and that I just kind of didn't expect some of the mental health challenges that came and that's, you know, explored a little more uh, in other parts of the piece. Um, 
and that my expectations <laughs> continued to be uh, kind of blown away, you know. That's, that's awesome. Um, and I'm glad to hear that you are in for those cool surprises that come with being a parent and parenting <laughs> a teen and all of the things. I've been on the other side very recently and I'm sorry for, <laughs> but, I'm also, yeah, yeah. but I'm also very grateful for all parents who um, are so, so supportive and who can write incredible pieces like this. And speaking of writing incredible pieces like this, um, I wanted to ask how you felt before writing this piece and after writing this piece. Um, as in, did you feel a certain growth? Did you feel a certain mm-hmm. quality? How did it? Sit with you. Um, you know, one thing I want to mention is my son has read the whole piece and is very supportive of it being out there, which I really appreciate from him. Um, you know, this scene about what happened with him in eighth grade had been running around in my head for years. I mean, he's 23 now. Um, and I, I was kind of surprised once I got it down that I'd never written about it. Um, and, and once I got it down and I did run it by a couple of writer friends, it started to feel important to me. Um, and there's stuff that comes before and after what I read. Um, in, in terms of writing a piece about mental health challenges and that they don't, you know, it's not like something starts in middle of eighth grade and is done two months later. You know, you can't always take care of stuff and wrap it up in a bow. So I, I'm actually... I've I've done a fair amount of personal essays and I'm really more proud of this piece than most of my work. So I'm really pleased the contest kind of pushed me to uh, really focus on this piece. Excellent. Well, I'm super glad that you were able to have an experience that was supportive and overall healing, I think. Um, Just because um, it sounds... I didn't know that your son had read the whole piece and was approving of it, which is an incredible addition. Um, And I had one more question for you. Mm -hmm. Basically, I want to ask you um, if you were to, if you were to take this piece and um, expand on it, is there a specific moment that you would dig into more or is there a specific um, idea that you would like to flesh out even more if we had, let's say, a different page count? Um, honestly, I'm going to say no. <laughs> um, because I uh, 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 I gave a... a so the, what I read is kind of from the middle, and then there's a beginning section that kind of fleshes out kind of who Nick... Uh, what Nick was like younger and what our relationship was like. And then the end kind of quickly summarizes what happened the next few years after this. And I just gave a lot of thought. Um, So, I mean, both of those, everything could be more detailed, but I'm actually pretty happy with the way it's played out. Yeah. The the ratios and everything were very, were very well spaced, I believe, but um, just wanted to double check with you and see um, if you as a writer had something else that you wanted to add besides the page count. But um, I'm so glad that I got to talk to you today and that we got to hear your piece. And as a reminder, if you would like to read the beginning or the end of Marianne's piece, feel free to check it out on the Bay Area Book Festival website under the 2020 Bay Area Book Festival Writing Contest. And with that, um, I will conclude Marianne's division and start over to Starly from the middle school division. Hi, I'm Starly, and I'll be reading an excerpt from my piece, Wonder Life. I quickly changed out of my Wonder Life suit and walked towards Ryder's room. He was still in his Wonder Life suit, but he no longer had his headset on. I looked at him and took a deep breath, preparing myself for what was coming. Were you seriously just playing Wonder Life for fun? I asked fiercely. He looked guiltily at the ground, avoiding my eyes, before looking up at me and saying, I know that I told you not to do it, But that doesn't mean that I can't. I'm older than... Just because you're older than me doesn't mean that you can set high expectations for me and then not follow them yourself, you little hypocrite. I interrupted, fuming. I'm 13, and you're telling me to get a job, go to school, and win us money in a game against pros. 
And then you go and break your own rule about not playing Wonder Life recreationally after lecturing me about it last night. That doesn't even make any sense. I know. And I'm sorry, Fiona. I just... You don't get to say you're sorry. You're a hypocrite who can barely manage to take care of us, I said heatedly. I knew immediately after I said it that I had gone way too far. But I honestly didn't care at the moment. I just stormed away and shut myself in my room, disappointed and shaking with anger. The next morning, things were tense. I just ate breakfast, grabbed my stuff, and got ready to go, but Ryder stopped me. Hey, Fiona. I know what I did last night was wrong. And I'm so sorry. I just wanted you to know that before you left, he hesitantly said. I turned around with a sigh, knowing I couldn't leave without resolving this. It's okay. I was wrong last night, too. I shouldn't have said those things about you. If we can find a way to work this out, I want to, I responded, swallowing my pride. I think we can work something out, he replied with a relieved smile. I gave a small smile in return and walked towards the couch. I think that we should come up with new expectations for now. We should be able to play Wonder Life recreationally at least once a week. Both of us need it. You do know that, right? I asked, a smirk breaking out on my face. Yeah, and I won't expect as much from you anymore. We should be able to get by without you playing Wonder Life competitively. You should grow up like a normal kid. I love you, he said affectionately. I grinned and hugged him back. Beautiful, Starly. That was that was a gorgeous piece, and I'm so glad that we got to hear it today. Um, and I really noticed that um, you leaned into dialogue quite a bit in that piece. And I know that some writers, when they write dialogue, read it out loud to themselves. Others just read it on the screen, on separate sides of the screen. Was there anything specific that helped you write convincing dialogue? Because yours was very, very good. Well, for the dialogue part, I kind of, like, leaned into dial to, like, talk conversations I've had before. Like, I don't know, I've bickered with my brother and, like, had conversations with my parents and, like, and friends. And I just kind of acted like I was one of the characters talking to the other one and just kind of wrote from there. So Mm -hmm. that's what I did. That's awesome. And since you're speaking about taking some experiences from your own life and expanding on them, like we mentioned earlier in this panel, um, I just wanted to quickly ask how you were able to step into a character um, rather than um, presenting this story as being from your point of view. Well, I kind of like, I tend to do this with a lot of stories too. Like I write characters And one of them is, like, pretty similar to me. So I just kind of, like, write them with part of me in them. And then, so I always, like, know what, like, the character is, like, figuring out and stuff. So you elaborate on that. But, yeah, I mainly, like, there's always a part of me in each of my characters. That's awesome. So you can basically ask yourself, like, oh, what would I do in this situation? And then your character would kind of do something similar. in Something similar or something different. Depends on who the character is, too, and what the situation is. That makes a ton of sense. Um, I was thinking that um, inspiration strikes differently for everyone, and everyone's experience is different. And I was asking, um, when you saw the prompt for expectations, it seems like um, this piece was prompted by the was prompted by the prompt. Um, And I was just wondering how inspiration struck for you. Was there a specific idea that came into your head when you first heard the prompt that you wanted to carry out throughout the whole piece? Actually, when I first like heard the prompt, I I had to think about it a bit because the first thing that came to mind was just like, 
like parents having expectations for their kids or something. But then I thought about like, what if there was like another element to it? What if mm-hmm. their parents were gone? What if it was an older brother or something? What if there was like, you had to win money? I had to think about a couple elements and then kind of came and just started writing. <laughs> Well, I'm so glad that you did explore all those what ifs. And I think that'll conclude our session for today. Thank you so much, Starly. Um, Last but definitely not least, we've got Melinda from the high school division coming up. Hi, um, I'm Melinda. And this is an excerpt from my piece entitled Clay or How to Shape Perfection. One, it begins as all things do in the dark, in the damp. The tremulous womb of stillness, the moisture-laden night thick and heavy without its stars. Things happen in the dark, mildew grows, silence ferments, but the main thing that happens is the waiting. The sky cracks, light pours in, cold and surgical and reverent, the first taste of that which will be known well, the breaking, the breaking of a day and of other things besides. The hands follow, make their hesitant way through the air, set light fingers on wet earth. From the morass, they carve a lump, an imperfect promise, an unformed heart leading itself back into its beginnings. No one said creation wasn't messy. Two, one of the questions a human child is perhaps exasperatingly fond of asking is that most dreaded of queries, but why? It is admittedly a useful phrase. Humans in general have been using it for millennia. It has been applied to an infinite range of situations, from a philosophical pondering of the color of the sky to a mundane request to take out the trash. As to one of the greater and more inexplicable of these, why, or indeed how, humans came to be, an impressive variety of people have reached a similar conjecture over the years. Humans, as many people and cultures will tell you, were made from clay. The exact circumstances surrounding this event are still up for debate. Perhaps some deity or other decided to experiment, or selected the medium with an artist's care, or simply reached for whatever was at hand. The details notwithstanding, it is a testament to our lasting connection to the earth that we as a species identify with it so strongly, and well we should. The earth to us is shelter and sustenance, permanence and possibility, solidity and constant change. In a way it is, and always has been, life itself. And yet, we who were born from the earth love ever so much to gaze up at the stars. Three, there is always a beginning before the beginning, a backstory, a before. So perhaps we should start elsewhere with a girl. She needs a name, I suppose, something more than a pronoun and a description. Let us call her M. Do with that what you will, an M for mystery or for magic, for the annoying kid you knew from your middle school English class, or that friend of a friend you always wanted to know better. So, we could start with M's beginning, a bundle of squinting black eyes and sparse dark hair, a hint of a nose and mouth, chubby hands clutching gracefully at nothing, lungs testing their strength in the sterile air. The doctor takes her measurements before she is released from the hospital and smiles. A perfect girl, the doctor says. Is she, though? And in any case, well, hers is not a perfect world. Four. In mathematics, M, like most letters, English and otherwise, is a variable, a replacement, something to stand for something else. The steepness of a straight line extending outwards in both directions toward an infinity it will never reach, a constant of change. We call this girl M for a reason. This is not her story. Here, she is but a creator, a dreamer, a pair of hands. This is not the story of her creation. So let us start again with the darkness, the light, the clay waiting in its bag, fermenting the way ideas do in the quiet. Oh my God, Melinda, that was 
Amazing. Um, the style of your piece is so distinct and in the best way possible. Um, I remember reading it for the very first time and being so impressed with the language and structure and the metaphors and all of the different um, suppositions that are included in your writing. Thank you. <laughs> no, really, it was truly inspiring. And I noticed that your writing is split up into several parts. You separate each part with a numerical, with a Roman number. Um, and I was asking, I was thinking of asking what inspired you to write in vignettes? Was it for a visual, a linguistic, or an aesthetic purpose, or was it all three? Hmm, good question. Um, I want to say that initially the idea of separating it into different parts came from another idea I was playing around with, um, but I think it kind of worked out well to have different parts sort of interweaving within each other. Like, I feel like the piece kind of has a couple different voices. Like you have the main story of M as she's trying to make the clay figure, but then um, I wanted also to include the other sort of tangents to other voices, ones that are more philosophical or poetic, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess it worked out that way. And you speak of this sort of intertwining of stories, and I was asking what kind of hope that you, what effect did you hope that the reader would ha would take away from your story? Um, was there like a certain theme that you really wanted to hammer home, or was there specifically a mood that you were thinking that the multiple voices could help enhance? Um, I'm not sure that I had a specific thing in mind when I was writing it because I feel like if I start writing with intention of going specifically for some sort of idea then sometimes it feels like either I'm being too vague or I'm kind of pounding it into the reader's head um, but once I saw the theme of expectations I kind of translated that more into what are our expectations for ourselves or as a society and what we think of when we say like what is perfection or what is something that we want to achieve um so having the different voices kind of come in and add their own aspects to something to see something a work and or i guess in this case i was trying to have it represent a person and see that you can come at it from different sides and there isn't one specific way to be perfect i think is the ultimate takeaway for this piece I think you did a great job of delivering it. And with that ultimate takeaway, I think that we will be able to conclude this whole session. Um, so if everybody wouldn't mind coming back on for a quick second as I give us a little outro. Hello, hello. Well, that just about wraps up our time today. So thank you again to the winners for joining us. Once again, I will introduce, um, I will introduce all of the writers with um, so joining me today is Christopher Hyun, Marianne Lonsdale, Melinda Yang, Nora Tan, Kelly Du, and Starley Tagade. Thank you again so much for coming, and thank you so much for your brilliant pieces and letting me pick your brains for a minute. If you really want to read a little bit more from their brilliance, at the end of this talk there will be a link to where you can read their stories in full. I'm Giovanna Lamonto, and you've been watching the Bay Area Book Festival Unbound. Goodbye! Bye-bye.